Hey guys, it's Kendra. And this is Jessica. And you're listening to Lucid, Lucid Lab. Lab. So I thought you were early today, which made me upset for a second. I'm a very punctual person. Yes. You can be late all you want, but early I never can't do <laughs> because I am up to the minute every minute when I'm trying to get stuff done. And I was brushing my teeth and uh, there was a knock on my door and I'm like, Kendra, <laughs> how early was it? It was like 8.50 or something. Oh, yeah. And I was like, that's 10 minutes, Kendra. <laughs> I need those 10 I minutes. I need those 10 minutes in the morning. So I opened the door with my toothbrush because I am Thought expecting it was you oh, and no. it was not you. So my mouth is full of toothpaste and this man is standing there with like a <laughs> delivery and this happens all the time for some reason. My number is really close to another number on another street. Right. And I live in one of those areas where all the streets are like, drive, place, duh, right. duh. And so I was trying to direct him somewhere else because I knew exactly where he needed to go. And he didn't speak any English. Oh, no. So I thought, you know, well, maybe one word I say will get through. But it wasn't. And he was so kind. He was just giggling and laughing like his smile made my day. Aww. But I could not say a word. All of my Spanish went out of my brain. Yeah. You're like, I and have I'm no like idea. sitting here and I'm like, oh, my God, I don't know what to do. So then I see my neighbor coming out of his house uh -huh. and I'm like, hey, do you know how to say this real quick? Because I knew it was a simple thing to say. Right. And he gave me like this dirty look. And he's like, oh, da, da, da. And I don't know how to say this. And he walked like 10 feet. And I'm like, that's fine. Because if you don't know how to say anything, you don't know how to say anything. Right. I'm not going to ask for anything else. But then he randomly stops and turns around in this like really annoyed voice and goes, Senor, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, he knew what he to knew. say. He didn't want to help. And he didn't want to help. But yet he speaks their language. Like it just pissed me off. But the guy gave me a hug after. Aww. It was like the <laughs> sweetest interaction that I've had in a while. And But then I left really angry with myself. I should be able to say these basic things without feeling like I need to go search it up. Right. Because this happens often. So I've made it a task for myself to learn how to help these people who come to my door often be able to go to where they need to go. So, so like I can write say out it some correctly. instructions or <laughs> yeah. write it out so that they just can read it. Be able to say it. Yeah. I can learn a few sentences. It's not going to hurt me. Right. You know? <laughs> it's probably so will help your brain. The only thing that will hurt me is they might think I can communicate with them after that and I can't. That's what always <laughs> happens to me. Me as I say like two words and then they start talking really fast in the other language and I'm like nope nope I'm not that good at but all. It breaks my heart because particularly with this man I felt a connection with him like there was this little soul moment between right. us and we couldn't communicate and I'm like this is the most frustrating thing in the world that I can't talk to this person who I can tell were two peas in a pod. Right. So, yeah. Anyway. It's hard. It was a moment of learning for me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a sweet little start to your day. And no, I'm I don't think I'm ever early to your place. You're not. You're always late. So that's yes. why I was like, Kendra, what the fuck right. are you doing right now? <laughs> I'm not ready for you. <laughs> Especially not when we're we're recording earlier than we usually do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely not early then. I think I was leaving my house at eight forty five. So okay. definitely not me at eight <laughs> fifty. How was your week? My week's been really good. It's been beautiful here and it has. Hot. Oh, yeah. My grass is completely fried. I got to turn on my sprinklers <laughs> today. Uh, speaking of that, like I went out and spent a bunch of money and got flowers last weekend and planted them all and they were all looking really pretty. But then it got so hot that one day I came home and they all looked like they were on death's oh, no. door. Like, But we nursed them back and they're all blooming now today. So That's I'm a happy pretty. flower lady. But I got out because I bought new hiking boots because I'm getting ready for Machu Picchu. That's right. And so I got to get my ass in gear. And I went out hiking for the first time this year, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and I did Mount Sinitas in Boulder oh. with the girl that I'm going to Machu Picchu with. And we got up super early on a Monday morning to try and do it before work. And it was great. Nobody was there. Usually it's a trail that's like packed out. But there's all these trail runners. So me and her are like huffing and puffing, like just walking. And these girls and guys that are Blast like little trail runners, past you. <laughs> they get to the top and, you know, we're not even to the top yet. And they're already coming back down. And I'm just like, I am so out of shape. But yeah, I don't but know. Those runners people, are a different breed. Exactly. There's yeah. a difference between them and the rest of humanity. Yeah. They're like superhumans. Yeah. 
That's their life, really. They probably ran from their house to get to the train. Exactly. And then, and the then they're going to go change into a business suit and or run jump on the their office. bike. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I feel like living in the Boulder area makes you feel like the laziest person alive because there are so many like Iron Man, superhuman mm-hmm. people that do get up at like the crack of dawn or I guess way before that. They get up at like 4 a.m. and do these like 10 mile hikes before they go to work in the morning. It's crazy. Because it's not only that they can actually physically do that, their entire life lifestyle is different than ours so don't hold it against yourself that is true they probably have a little more money and freedom money freedom food yes accessible food that's actually good for you which we're finding out that's not much in america no so and they probably have help to do things around the house Mm -hmm. while they're out running and hiking and (laughs) all that but i am proud of myself i feel like because i've been doing so much walking lately i was not as winded as i would have been because i've done that same trail like i don't know three or four years ago and i remember it being much harder so that's good I'm getting there yeah (laughs) (laughs) but we're gonna try and do the Manitou incline have you heard of that yes because I went down there yes and it was suggested that we go do that and I know my body and I was like "Mm, that's not my idea of a break right now it is because it was my only two days of having a break in months (laughs) and you don't want to climb I don't even know how many steps it is for those who aren't familiar it's a famous thing here in Colorado and it's a lot of steps yeah it's a very scary scary incline up. Yeah, like it's you're, like straight up. Yes. And then what scares me about that is coming back down. I know. I'm a How little do you afraid. Do that? And you come down while people are coming up. So it's going to be. And you're tired going down. So you're jello. Yeah. How do you not die and just blah, 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 all the way to the ground? I'll just roll to the <laughs> bottom. I don't know. We're going to try it. Okay. Let me know how it it's goes. It's been on my list for a while. I don't feel like I've ever been in enough shape to do it. <laughs> I know that there's one in Castle Rock that I, I mean, if you want to do a beginner style. <laughs> oh, really? Like yeah, a practice? somewhere. Mm-hmm. Mm, I might try that. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's something to work up to over the next couple of months. Yes. So what are we doing today? We definitely have an interesting one today. I remember hearing about the story years ago Mm -hmm. and I came upon it again recently and I thought it would be a fun one to do. Well, not really fun. We always say fun. It's murder (laughs) and all that jazz, but we have a different idea of fun. I think so. Yeah. It's definitely intriguing, though, because of the time and area that it takes place. Okay, so I'm going to tell you the story about the bloody benders. The bloody benders. Have you heard of them? I have not. Really? Okay, I have not. This is actually one I feel like I've known about for about 15 years or so. Mm -hmm. But the reason why it sticks in your brain is, well, I guess you'll find out after this. (laughs) (laughs) There's just a few details of this story that just stick with you. And I think that's why people end up remembering this story. I know it's in Kansas because you mentioned that during last week's episode. Yes. So the Bloody Benders are a family of serial killers from the 1870s. Okay. So we're going to go way back, back to a time of land grabbing, lawlessness, and when there was no such thing as a serial killer. So what were they considered back then? Just I have no idea. It would be another hundred years until serial killer was coined, like the name. Yeah. I think it's safe to say that serial killers have been operating since the dawn of man. Uh, Yes. (laughs) It's only when it came to be heavily frowned upon that it became an outlandish thing to do. So it was just part of the culture (laughs) before? I think so. You know, you were allowed to defend yourself or whatever you want to call it. And then we have to remember that people who have power over other people were serial killers, Mm -hmm. you know, slave owners. There's tons of serial killers. It's not a new thing. Right. You know, in ancient times, killing seemed like it was more for status purposes. Right. If you think about it. Exactly. Like someone's in your way. Yes. Like a jilted lover or something like that. It was more accepted. It was like a means to an end. Right. Or they would even kill people over really stupid stuff. Like someone stole your bread. And it was okay. And that was okay. But I think when I think of a serial killer today, I think of people who have to kill. Or they're like doing it in a very calculated way. Like they're planning it out. Yeah, like Like they they dream about it. It has to be done. It gives them their own fucked up sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. That's what I think of when I think of a serial killer today. And that is who we are dealing with. Okay. But it's not just at the hands of one person. It's the whole family. But four. Four people. Four people. And what is scary is I'm only talking about a one and a half year long period. Wow. Of killing in this family's life, which amounted to at least 11 dead that we know of, likely double or triple that. Crazy. And they most likely killed before and they most likely killed after. Wow. 
But before I can talk about the benders, I want to set the scene because Kansas back then wasn't the same Kansas as it is now. Mm -hmm. Kansas was part of America's untamed frontier. Before settlers arrived in Kansas, the land was home to various Native American tribes, yeah, as everywhere to, yeah. in America, <laughs> including the Kanza, Osage, Pawnee, and Cheyenne. Mm -hmm. The area we will focus on later was inhabited by the Osage people. It was in the 1800s that American settlers began to arrive in significant numbers to Kansas. Here we come to take your land. Exactly. In the years leading up to the Civil War, Kansas was a turbulent and pivotal territory. With the rise in conflict over the issue of slavery, this area was known as Bleeding Kansas because of violent guerrilla warfare between pro-slavery and anti-slavery groups. Uh. For seven years, Kansas was the battleground over the future of slavery in the United States. They were recruiting for both sides. Right. But why Kansas? Kansas was a strategic location and upcoming state of the Union. At the time, the states of the U.S. were separated by slave states and free states. If Kansas became a free state, then the free states would outdo the slave states, mm -hmm. and that ruffled some feathers. Both groups fought over this. The Republican Party was born from this. Oh, okay. Missouri, which borders Kansas, was a slave state. Mm -hmm. The issue of whether to slave or not to slave was going to be decided by voters meaning illegal settlers of this area would decide like because they're in the middle of kicking everybody out. OK, which is just crazy to me. And remember when we talked about Sally House, that area of Atchison, Kansas, were the pro slavery people going in there. Mm -hmm. The Osage people were still there yeah. while this was happening. It wouldn't be until after the Civil War that the Osage people were forced to move to Oklahoma. So you've got people coming into an area and they're busy not only taking over and doing horrible things to the natives that live there. They're also debating whether or not they want to own other people yes, as slaves. Like, exactly. How fucked up is our history? It is so fucked up. <laughs> what is up with the people from this time? I just like our country more and more every day, though. Yeah, because this shit still goes on. Fucking dystopian bullshit. It's fucked up. But this vote was controversial because current residents were divided. A group of abolitionists from New England sent anti-slavery settlers to Kansas to ensure it would become a free territory. And on the other side, thousands of pro-slavery Missourians flooded into the new territory to illegally vote in Kansas's first territorial election in November of 1854. The following year in March, when the election took place, thousands of heavily armed border ruffians showed up in Kansas again and through illegal votes and intimidation of anti-slavery voters, they ensured the election of a state of pro-slavery legislators. This makes me so mad. Just the voter intimidation. We see that coming back nowadays. And yes, they're just bringing back tactics from back then. Just oh, it's evil, everywhere. Evil fucking people that want their agenda to go through no matter what. You, you saw that Kansas City chief guy with oh, his fucking fuck agenda him. at graduation. Oh, my God. Yeah. Of course, anti-slavery settlers refused to accept this government and set up their own. So for a time, there were two different governments in the exact same place. Oh, that's going work. on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some of these free staters known as Jayhawkers armed themselves in preparation for clashes with pro-slavery forces. As tensions increased within the territory, President Franklin Pierce recognized the pro-slavery legislature as the only legitimate government in Kansas. OK, well, we know what side he was on. But these Jayhawkers prevailed because Kansas was entered into the Union as a free state on January 29th, 1961. Well, that's good. Prior to this, for seven years, there was violent fighting, which eventually led to the Civil War just a few months later. Oh, wow. After bleeding Kansas in the Civil War and the forced relocation of the Osage people to Oklahoma, it was a newly freed land, <laughs> which was made available to homesteaders. Oh, nice. Now that you got, you know, the original people out of the way. Yep. People came to Kansas from around the world in the 1870s. New immigrants made the prairie into productive farmland. They came from Croatia, Germany, Russia, Sweden, Denmark, England, France, and other states from the U.S., including Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Kentucky, Missouri, Ohio, Illinois, and New York. 
the American government offered anyone who could afford an $18 claimant fee 160 acres of land. That's crazy. Of course, back then, $18 was probably a lot of money. Not for 160 acres of land. But there was a caveat. These people needed to prove that they could survive harsh elements of the prairie and thrive. And if they could maintain their land for five years, then the 160 acres was theirs to keep. Okay. So it was like a trial period. Okay. I did look it up. It's worth $345 today. Yes. That's what I'm saying. really nothing. That's nothing. That's crazy. I wish I had an option. Like you might be able to ask them if you could take a handful of dirt from 160 (laughs) acres of land for that. And then they're like, "Uh, no, that's at least $600. I know for a fact that that's probably like three tons. So that's all you're going to get. Two, three tons of dirt. That's what you can pay for. But this wasn't an easy task. $18 $18 wasn't much, but these people were moving thousands of miles away from everything they knew. Mm-hmm. They were lured by a promise of fertile soil and beautiful open prairies. And then they got there and it was not? It was not. This chance to be landowners and have a better life was what everybody wanted, right? Yeah. But the journey to Kansas for most was deadly. Mm. Any travel is yeah, back then. Back then. Many did not survive, and if they did, when they got there, they quickly realized that the soil was not fertile. It was difficult to farm there because of harsh weather, low rainfall, and swarms of locusts would attack the crops. Ew. They didn't have irrigation back then. So. Right. <laughs> It seems like when you think of Kansas, you're like, all it is is farmland, right? Yeah, nowadays. But back then, without all this modern stuff we have today, it wasn't an easy place to grow things. And there was a lack of building materials, which led many families to living in squalor. Yeah, because there's not a lot of trees in Kansas. No. So they would like make their homes sometimes out of little hills. So they went from (laughs) living in like an actual house sometimes to just making what they can of it. Yeah, a hole in the side of the mountain. And although Kansas was a free state in regard to slavery, there was a lot of lawlessness. With the new railway system, it brought in a lot of bad dudes. Always. Bad dudes everywhere, always. (laughs) (laughs) They just flock to wherever is the new place they can be a bad dude. (laughs) Settlements popped up along the railway lines that were not for these new farmland families. They were for restless, violent cowboys. There were tons of saloons, dance halls, gambling rooms, and sex workers. It attracted outlaws. Yeah. There really wasn't an organized law enforcement yet in these areas. And for the most part, people handled shit on their own, defending Mm -hmm. their families when they saw fit. Okay. In 1867, Labette County was established, which today is just seven miles northeast of Cherryville. It was a less settled area than others in Kansas, so you could get away with more. So that's where we're going to spend our time today, mostly. In October of 1870, in the township of Osage, five spiritualist families showed up. Okay. One of those families was the Bender family. At first, two of the four people in the family arrived in Kansas. This was John Bender and John Bender Jr. When they arrived at a trading post there, they said they were looking for some land. Mm -hmm. John, who also went by William, was around 55 to 60 years old. John Jr. initially introduced himself as John Gabhart, but later was referred to as John Bender Jr. We're going to come back to this several times. (laughs) Okay. He was in his 20s. They registered 160 acres of land, which was adjacent to the Great Osage Trail, which was the only open road for traveling further west. They built a cabin, a barn with a corral, and dug two wells. And then after that, in the fall of 1871, Ma and Kate Bender arrived. Okay. The older woman, she went by or was known as Ma, but her name was Elvira. Elvira. Okay. She was 45 to 55 years old. We'll just call the older John and Elvira Ma and Pa okay. for the rest of this story. Kate, or Katie Bender, I'll just call her Kate, was also in her 20s. She was described as being very pretty with long red flowing hair, and she got a lot of attention from men in the area. They weren't the friendliest family. Pa spoke little English. He was believed to be a German immigrant, although there's no proof of where he is from. Okay. But they all spoke German. Those Germans. (laughs) Pa was described as a repulsive, hideous brute. He was dirty, profane, and ill-tempered, which was a great review. But (laughs) it's more than likely from someone who, I don't know, probably didn't like spiritualists or something like that. 
So what exactly are spiritualists? There's a lot of different groups that can fall under that title. Okay. But for this episode, I don't know. Just think of like the cunning folk from... From England. From, from England. <laughs> what was that? Pendle Witch Trials. <laughs> right. Something like that. Okay. There's all kinds of different types though. But then again, he might have been this ogre. Could've I don't been. know. Ma, although she spoke German as well, is thought to be Elmira Hillmark. So I said Elvira before, but she's either one. Okay. Or none. <laughs> <laughs> or it's a complete alias. Exactly. Not from Germany, but instead born in the Adirondack Mountains of New York, she's okay. thought to be. She first married a man named Simon Mark, who she claimed to have 12 children with. Where most of those children are in this story, who knows, because she married again. Mm -hmm. This time to William Stephen Griffith, who she was later rumored to have killed. Oh, okay. <laughs> and it was rumored that Ma murdered several husbands. So there may have been another before choosing what was left of life with John. Mm. And there is also rumor that she killed a few of her children. Okay. Of course, none of these rumors can be proven. But given what I will tell you, I guess it's not a stretch to put it past these people. Mm -hmm. Or to put it past anyone to, you know, have fun expanding on her crimes for the fun of it. Yeah. <laughs> she immediately earned the nickname She Devil in oh. the community. One person even wrote about her saying she was, quote, dirty old Dutch crone. Oh, wow. <laughs> her face was a fit picture of the midnight hag that wove the spell murderous ambition about the soul of Macbeth. OK, that's quite a description. That's why I'm saying I think these people were just against them mm -hmm. for something else because they go a little bit overboard sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> John Jr. was a decently nice person who had a bit of an odd tick. Okay. He would laugh like a hyena while talking or just out of nowhere. Mm. No one says anything to him <laughs> and he just starts fucking laughing. <laughs> that's unhinged. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's creepy. <laughs> Very creepy. Some people thought he was a bit slow, mm -hmm. but he was known for this. Otherwise, he was quiet. Socially awkward, maybe. Mm. Very. Kate was the most outgoing in the group. She spoke for the family most of the time and more were acquainted with her. In some sources, I found that the lot was educated and Kate not only spoke English, German, but also French. Okay. But regardless of all that, everyone knew them as a family, all of the same blood. Mm, but maybe not. That is how they presented themselves anyway. And some question that because John and Kate were witness to act a little bit differently than siblings should. Oh, were they like holding hands and making out? I don't know. People mentioned just, you know, more like how lovers would act. <laughs> She's sitting on his lap. And Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and also how John introduced himself to some people with having an entirely different last name. Yeah, that's weird. The only blood relation that most people believe today is between Ma and Kate. Okay. And that Kate was one of her many children from another husband. So Pa's not her father. But real quick, back to Kate in that way, because she was really outspoken for the free love movement. Okay. Originating in the 19th century, free love was a concept that essentially meant the absence of legal ties in a relationship. Leave the government out of it type of thing. Oh, That's okay. That's really I, what it was. I support that. But it's, you know, evolved to include many different types of relationships since then. Mm -hmm. Like same sex relationships. Just you can be with anybody you want. It's just love. But right? maybe not sisters and brothers. Yes. I think Kate, if they were siblings, was using her voice to be like, it's all right if I it's sleep fine. with my brother. <laughs> it's love, man. I love him. It's yes. okay. And there's not a lot of choices. It's I know they're in the, out middle in the middle of, of nowhere. She's, She's like, you're around my age. He's the only guy that's under 50. Just don't laugh. <laughs> <laughs> right. Maybe that was a turn on for her. Maybe. So where they built their home was in an area of land between a chain of low hills that today is known as the Bender Mounds. Okay. The Osage Trail was a Native American trading route and chain of footpaths before, and it ran between these hills. It was actually a set of trails that ran thousands of miles between nine current states. And in 1825, it became known as the first section of the Santa Fe Trail. Okay. But the trail we'll be talking about today was a stretch of 47 miles between St. Paul and Independence, Kansas. Okay. It was not an easy trail to transverse, 
Depending on the time of year, there was snow, freezing nights, lightning strikes, floods, and dust storms. And not just that, some worries to deal with weren't weather related, like violent thieves that might come upon you. Yeah. You were vulnerable on the trail to bandits and horse thieves. And depending on where you were, maybe a Native American every now and then. Right. Because they're pissed. (laughs) Yes. They rightly should be. Many believe the Benders chose this area of land specifically because of this trail. Their home was pretty dang small, only 16 feet by 24 feet. It was a one-room cabin located on the south side of the trail, the trail being only 10 feet away. Okay. So very close. Right there. Inside it was separated into two spaces. There was a canvas sheet hung between the two spaces. On one side, the back of the cabin, that's where they slept. Okay. Which wasn't a lot of space. For four people. Yeah. The front of the cabin was a small inn for traveling guests. A small store where they sold basic groceries like liquor, gunpowder, and tobacco. And even like a little spot for a saloon. What? How? (laughs) I don't know. They were like feng shui the shit out of that cabin. Right. It's a very random place to pitch a store, but there really weren't many options along the trail. So they did have travelers stop in and stay the night. That was a really small area to stay the night. And you're like sleeping right next to the four people. That's weird. I think depending on the time of year, like they might come and get a meal and then some of these cowboys would still sleep outside. Oh, okay. That would make more sense. If it was winter, they are really just getting inside. Mm -hmm. They're like propped up against their own shit sitting on the floor type of situation. Situation. It's not like they get a bed. Okay. <laughs> because I think even the benders in the back are sharing one big straw bed. Right. <laughs> but that was, I guess, common back then. Right. For the most part, the older benders had no desire to shoot the shit with their guests. Okay. Which in such a small space, it's pretty odd. Mm-hmm. Especially if you are inside and you're trying to sleep and you can hear four other people breathing <laughs> and snoring and sniffing and doing whatever behind that sheet. Yeah. Not my choice of comfort. But when you are desperate for a hot meal and rest, yeah, you take what you can get. Yeah. And it wasn't only the host's manners that was in question at times, but also the cleanliness. The home was described as being covered in a layer of dust and grime. Yeah. Very cluttered, and there was an endless amount of flies always present. I would question the food you're eating. People even reported being served food on dirty dishes and previously used utensils that were clearly not washed. Ew. And there was a very foul smell. Most couldn't put their finger on, but something with the smell there wasn't quite right. The dead people. The dead people. <laughs> <laughs> what were they eating? I what were they serving? dead people. <laughs> But it wasn't just Ma and Pa that didn't want to socialize. They would make their distaste for lodgers known, like huff and puff and scowl at them. Then why the (laughs) fuck are you lodging people? You don't have to. Because they need them for something later. To make their meals for the other lodgers. People have to make money. That's their way to make money. But they weren't shy to show their annoyance. And some annoyed them so much that Pa would end up chasing them off with a gun. Like, get the fuck out. Okay. (laughs) John and Kate were a little different, though. John had his German accent, which was pretty strong. And if Kate had one, it was very slight. Okay. John and Kate were friendlier with the guests and did try to get involved with the community. At first, people thought they were charming. John was kind of handsome and strong. Kate was warm and got along with others easily. They smiled a lot and they just seemed like young adults trying to make the most out of life with their new surroundings. Trying to make friends. Yeah. After knowing what they have done, many began to see their initial friendliness as manipulation instead. They knew what they were doing. Mm. But it was Kate more than any of them that really had a way of putting people at ease, especially the men. She was a prize and they all wanted to know Kate. Oh, okay. Because I think I read somewhere too that in addition to like her voluptuous body and her long luscious locks, she also had like a scar on her face that was intriguing. Oh, everybody wants I to think know how Maybe did above you her get eyebrow it? or somewhere. Okay. So it just made her look, I need to know her story type Tell of woman. Tell me what happened to you. So not long after being in Osage, Kate put out an advertisement in the local papers and continued to do so during their time there, introducing herself as a medium who could communicate with the dead and had the power to heal people. Okay. She was also known to give lectures in the area about spiritualism, feminism, and free love. So she sounds great. She sounds like someone I'd want to be friends with, except for she's sleeping with her brother. And possibly murdering a lot of people. So yeah, that might... (laughs) Make for an awkward (laughs) friendship. She would often invite people back to their cabin in the early evenings for seances. Where are they doing seances? They have a room in this cabin. They have a little table. That's their saloon. (laughs) (laughs) 
Kate wasn't the only one. Other spiritualist families in the area did the same, all claiming to have a medium in their house. Okay. But Kate was different. With her fiery red hair, her curves, and her personality, she attracted a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And with the way things were in Kansas, death seemingly always around the corner, people were open to it. She sometimes, along with a neighbor named Susanna, would hold these seances as often as possible. Kate also sold written charms of protection for fertility and good luck. And when men were in her presence for these events, it is said that they had a hard time closing their eyes when she'd tell them to. (laughs) Because they just wanted to stare, apparently, and had trouble following instructions. They're just so taken with her beauty. She was a siren, I guess. Sounds like maybe she was some witch. She could have been. She cast a spell on all these men. Yep. It wasn't long after establishing themselves in the community, though, which I think was only like a few weeks, that they were accused of stealing. Okay. In the area, there were two business partners, Rudolph Brockman and Edward Earn, who owned the local trading post. And around this time, Edward was looking forward to marrying a girl from Germany. Okay. He brought her and her mother to Kansas and decided that he wanted to get a bit of his own land and start a store, which was similar to what the Benders were doing. Mm -hmm. So he actually had his girlfriend and her mother stay with the Benders while he found land and could build something for them. That's a lot of people. I was just to sitting here house. like trying to figure out where were two more people sleeping. Especially like an older woman. Like yeah. she needs to lay down, not sit up and prop herself no. somewhere. Maybe they just invited her into their bed with them. It's possible because they were German and being that they were German, they could speak with the benders. And it seemed like it was kind of a friendlier lodging situation than normal. Mm-hmm. And Kate and the younger woman actually became close. Okay. But one day, Kate told everyone that they should go for a walk and at some point during this walk ma and pa stopped and went back to the cabin and when john kate and their two guests got back to the cabin the mother found some of her things missing (laughs) this included a jewelry box and several cashier checks that totaled around thirty two hundred dollars that's a lot of money back then that's a lot of money this money is all the girl and her mother had yeah Yeah. unlike today with our banks and credit cards, you traveled with everything that you had if you're Mm -hmm. moving. Mm -hmm. The benders were accused, of course, and denied having anything to do with it. Okay, who else did? Come on. They said the theft must have happened when they were on their walk. Because they are on a trail. Someone just came in and took it. Mm -hmm. But if that's the case, why wasn't anything else taken? Yeah, none of the bender (laughs) stuff was taken? No. I mean, it was a store. Right. They could have have taken gunpowder, all the cool stuff. Yeah, Yeah. definitely liquor. Come on. I mean, right? (laughs) Back then, I would be drunk all the time (laughs) just to survive. That's true. (laughs) You wouldn't have made it past 20 then. (laughs) I would need to be drunk just to handle all the smells back then because I have a very sensitive nose. (laughs) Seriously, I don't think I could deal with the smelly stuff. Yeah. Nope. Even just B.O., How do you get past that? I guess it's just something you become used to. You grow up with it your whole life. It's It's just just a smell. You become nose blind. Yikes. Anyway, apparently nothing came from this case. It sucked because they lost everything they had. Yeah, what are they going to do now? They have no money. And I mean, thankfully, she has her fiance. Mm -hmm. But that was her mom's life savings. Yeah. And even though the benders weren't charged of this in any way, it left a bad taste in people's mouths. Like they remembered this for a long time. Okay. Not long after this, in the spring of 1871, Kate got a job as a waitress in Cherryvale. At the Cherryville Hotel. Okay. Cherryville was more of a bustling town. It was one of the earlier settlements, so it had a lot more things going on there. A lot of businesses, a lot of opportunities. And it was only two miles from the Bender property. Okay. And there, Kate met a girl, a fellow waitress, Julia Hessler. While working together, the two became close. Julia was interested in spiritualism and participated in a couple of seances with Kate and others at the hotel. Kate ended up inviting Julia to their cabin for a seance and Julia was happy to go. But when she got there, she was immediately confused because it was just her and Kate. Oh, yeah, that would be weird. It threw her off at first, but Kate explained that it was just the two of them because the spirits told her it should just be the two of them. So where did the other three people go? We'll come to that. Okay, but Julia was confused because typically in seances... There's a lot of people. You're like around a big table. Mm -hmm. There's multiple people. It's not just you and two people. Right. Back then. It was like this whole event. Communal thing. But she let it go and agreed to continue. 
even though she was really distracted by the smell and flies. <laughs> Ew. Trying not to be rude, though, she closed her eyes and listened to Kate summoning whatever. At the time, Kate had her sitting in a chair that was in front of the canvas that separated the two parts of the cabin with Kate sitting directly across from her. Okay. Julia tried to keep her eyes closed, but she couldn't focus with all the things that were bothering her senses. Because there's like flies landing all and over her face. And then smell. Yeah. She opened her eyes to see John, Ma, and Pa standing behind Kate. Ooh. She didn't even hear them come in. Creepy. They were just like hiding somewhere. Behind the canvas. Yeah. Initially shocked, it turned to fear instantly with the way that they were all looking at her. Ooh. And she noticed Pa was holding a large hammer Uh-oh. of sorts. And without hesitation, Julia thought up an excuse to leave. She said she needed to go use the restroom and started walking to the front door. But as she was, she could hear them following her. Mm. So as soon as she opened the door, she just bolted into the dark because this is night. And I mean, it's dark. This is Kansas in the 1870s. (laughs) Streetlights. So she ran out and she could hear them running after her. And as she was running as fast as she could, she heard gunshots and she heard the four of them just like yelling at each other in German. Okay. This account was actually published in the Frontier Times later. Mm. Julia said that Kate was yelling at the others that they weren't fast enough and that they let her get away. Julia did get away, thankfully, but it's a wonder why something wasn't done then. Yeah, (laughs) it's obvious that there's some weird shit. This is just a weird story. Take everything with a grain of salt. Okay. okay? Because we can argue that maybe that didn't happen at all. No. And that maybe when all of this came out with what the benders were accused of doing, that Julia decided it was just time to tell a story, whether it was true or not. Okay. (laughs) We'll never know. There are some people who believe that the benders weren't murderers at all, which I'm not going to entertain here because conspiracy about that. That's interesting. You'll see why. And I think most of it has to do with, you know, people coming after them, persecuting them for being spiritualists. And so that's why they did what they did. So I think it's more people like they shouldn't get that bad of a rap. I'm like, they killed a lot of people. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's just move forward from that. Whether they were pushed to do that or not, it doesn't matter for this They're because still they killed a lot of people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's got to be another way than killing There's people. There's another way. You can maim them. <laughs> you can maim them. <laughs> <laughs> you can cut their hands off. You can sew their lips shut. I don't know. I'm just yeah. thinking of Handmaid's Tale now, <laughs> right. which is bad. <laughs> don't want to think about that right now. It may be our life soon. I know. At least I look good in red. Is that what color they wear? Yes. Okay. If we have to. That's the way America's going. That's what she says in, in one of the episodes. Red's my color or at least I look good in red. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> yeah. I haven't watched that show. I've only seen the first two seasons years and years ago. Oh, you got to watch the whole fucking thing. Yeah. Think of it as a preparation. Yeah. <laughs> I read the book a long time ago too. Yeah. Anyway, during this time, the trail the Benders were on was the only passage between Cherryville and the Osage Mission. This was a settlement in southeast Kansas. It had banks, supplies, and a land office. So this is where you would go to apply for land. And today, this is St. Paul, Kansas. Okay. Later that year, in the fall of 1871, the Ferrix arrived in Baxter Springs, Kansas. They came to the U.S. from Ireland in hopes for a better life and opportunity. This was James and his wife, Mary, and their young son. James got a job for the railroad company. He was employed to lay tracks and was often gone for work. Mm -hmm. Mary was alone and didn't have anyone else to depend on, so they decided to move to Howard County where Mary could connect with others while James was away. The couple became close with their neighbors, the Wattons. They were a younger couple in their 30s, but they had seven children already. Poor girl. I know. The Ferrix had a plot of land, but no home yet. So Mary decided to take her son to New York to stay with her sister while the home was being built. And meanwhile, James would stay with the Wattons. James dropped them off at the train station and headed back to Howard County via the Osage Trail. But he would never get there. Uh Uh-oh. Mary wrote James after she safely arrived in New York, but she never heard back from him. Weeks passed and she was very worried. She thought about going back to Kansas, but she wasn't sure if there was a home for her to go back to. But she's not hearing from him. Yeah. Until one day she received a letter from Mrs. Watton in December of 1871. She said no one had seen him after he dropped them off at the train station in Baxter Springs. Oh. She mentioned that the weather was really bad at the time and she feared that he didn't survive it. 
No one knew to look into the small cabin along the trail. Yeah, the but benders. James was gone. In early 1872, the usually outgoing and welcoming John and Kate Bender were starting to act strange. Okay. Mom, Pa being weird wasn't new, but others started to notice a change in the younger two. At first, Kate was known for helping others via her gifts for free. Mm -hmm. She only charged if something worked. Okay. That's how she would do things. But now she was starting to expect payment and she would get irritated easily. Performing at a local boarding house as a medium, at first people saw her as a warm and happy person, but she soon started to threaten people who uh, refused to pay for her services. That's probably not good for business. Even those that didn't ask for it or thought she was just like trying to show them a parlor trick. You know how yeah. like someone comes up to you and they're like, look what I can do. Yes. Give me money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's annoying. <laughs> And as we see time and time again in history, people started to think of her as a witch, Ooh. especially when she would threaten to curse someone for not paying. That kind of gives you witch vibes. Yeah. And that included people who stopped by the end. Some who were regulars, they realized that, all right, I'm not always going to see gracious, friendly Kate because sometimes she would be really cold and clearly not wanting them to be there. Mm. And that's only noticeable because they're paying guests, you know? Right. And some of them would make a habit out of stopping there just to talk with her and were disappointed to find her being standoffish. <laughs> Maybe she... Maybe it's bipolar, the time of the month. Or, Leave her alone. Yeah. I was like, maybe she's bipolar. <laughs> I mean, there could be lots of reasons. She's crammed into a cabin with like. Seriously. How long parents. can you be happy in that? Yeah. You're going to get depressed. <laughs> I'm depressed for her. <laughs> but lodgers kept coming because it really was the only place to stop and rest along this part of the trail. Okay. And others started to notice that John was gone a lot. The younger John. Okay. No one knew what for, and he would just all of a sudden be gone for long extended periods of time. Okay. In March of 1872, a body, or rather body parts, were found by a group of people walking along a river. Ooh. There was a campsite, and all strewn about were body parts. Oh, my God. Whoever this was had clearly been taken apart by animals over time. But what made this discovery concerning is that the person's skull showed the main reason for his death, which was blunt force trauma. Mm. The skull was caved in. This was the Wild West, essentially, so it could have been anyone. Right. But we'll come back to why this murder is tied back to the benders. Okay. I was going to say, I mean, Pa did have a hammer, according to that one girl. Yep. I like to hammer. Mm -hmm. Hammer people. It's a cheap weapon. A necessary weapon for farmland. Yeah. It's just a convenience. Very brutal way it to is. kill someone. It is. Later that year, in late September, while fishing in Big Hill Creek by Cherryville, not too far away from the Bender cabin, two young brothers came upon some interesting items. In a bush, they found a blood-stained dress and then a men's shirt. And not too long later, they found a man floating in the creek. Uh -huh. Although the first body I mentioned was too damaged to be identified, the man in the creek was identified as William Jones. Okay. Jones was a teacher. Shortly before his body was found, he had left his family to go to the Osage Mission to a school to teach a course and pay off some debt. He was carrying around $250 with him on his trip. Unfortunately, he never got back home. And it wasn't until October 17th of that year, after reading about a body that was found and the description of the man, that William's wife, Martha, recognized that it was probably her husband. Okay. That's what's sad. A lot of these people go away and it's not like they have cell phones. Yeah, and you know that there's probably many ways that they could die while gone, so you don't know. Right. William, like the other man found, had a blow to the head and a large neck wound. Okay. So he couldn't have known that with the other body because he was eaten up all over right. the place. He left behind his wife and three young children. And with this, there was an investigation, but nothing came from it. And when I say investigation, I'm talking about people in the town trying to investigate Yeah, there's it. no like <laughs> detectives back right. then. The only witness, but not really a witness, was the owner of the land where William was found. This is R.M. Bennett. They thought it might have been him at first, but he was, I guess, absolved. He was seen as not a killer type. Right. He said a week before William was found, while he was inside his cabin, he claimed to have heard a strange noise and realized that it was coming from a wagon on the trail that was giving off this rattle noise. 
Mm -hmm. And in during this investigation, they found faded wagon tracks and the tracks showed that one of the back wheels was twisted. Okay. From probably too much weight and that that would have given off that noise. Mm -hmm. I'm trusting them because we're not wagon experts. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, after this, three more men not related and separate events went missing after heading down the Osage Trail. Okay. Communities in the area started to feel uneasy. Mm -hmm. Of course, there were just normal worries of taking that trail, but with so many, one right after another, it was something people weren't used to, and soon talk of a murderer amongst them started to spread. Okay. Leroy Dick, who was the township trustee of Cherryvale, heard about the deaths and disappearances. Outside of people coming to him to warn him that this was unusual and that maybe we should be worried, he chalked it up to just normal. That's just part of it. That's life. Yeah. (laughs) The trail wasn't easy to transverse. And this is just what happens. Every now and then, some people don't make it back or don't make it to their destination. Yeah. But little did he know that his cousin would fall to the same fate. Oh, and then he cares. (laughs) No, not quite. Okay. (laughs) Okay. This was a cousin he didn't really care for. Oh, but so he's like, good riddance. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> His cousin came to visit him in November of 1872. This was Henry McKenzie. He went by Hank. It was unexpected because Hank was traveling from Cherryville to Independence to apply for some land and visit his sister. His purpose wasn't to see Leroy, but thought he'd just stop in to say hello. And Leroy's like, you shouldn't have, really. You shouldn't (laughs) have. (laughs) And this is just because Hank was like really out there. It was just, he was just too much for him. I I picture Leroy as this buttoned up older man with glasses who's quiet. And Hank is just like, yeah, man, let's go party. You know, I love you, right? (laughs) Smacks him on the head or something. He's just too much for him. So he was happy to see him leave the next day, and it wouldn't be until later that Leroy would find out that Hank never made it to Independence. Okay. And it was around this same time that another man also went missing from the trail. This was Benjamin Brown. He had a wife named Mary and two young children. He left Cedarvale to head to Osage Mission to get a loan so that he could get land for his family because he wanted to farm the whole shebang. Mm -hmm. And when he got there, sadly, his request was denied. Okay. He was devastated. He wanted this for his family and he was embarrassed and felt like he couldn't go home before finding a solution. So he decided to try again, but this time in another town. So he was going to head to Independence to a different loan office there. And as the story goes, he never made it home. Okay. Out of concern, Mary took it upon herself to go search for her husband along the trail herself. Oh, wow. Stopping by everywhere that a person could be. She didn't find him, but she did find the Bender cabin on her way back. And she's like, that's creepy as fuck. No, she stopped there for some food because that's what you do. It's a place to stop. It's an inn and it's It's a store. It's the only place. Yeah. And she stopped there and enjoyed their company so much when she was there that she spent the night before heading back to her children. Wow. Wow not knowing that her husband might be on that property. Mm, That's so weird. I always liked her story. She's like, someone's going to take my man. I'm going to go find him. Hold my children. And I just imagine her jumping on a horse and going, yeah, I'll (laughs) find him. And she's just running all over the place looking for him. That's true love right there. Right. And in December of 1872, two other men left for independence for the same reasons as Benjamin. They wanted to buy land for their families. This was George Burton and William McCrotty. George left first with William leaving shortly after. Only George made it to Independence and McCrady did not. It was found out that along the way, William stopped in Lador, Kansas and was told that the Bender Inn would be a safe place to spend the night. Uh, Not so much. No. And that same month later, a body of a man was found dumped on the prairie, later identified as John Phipps. He was traveling on the Osage Trail with $300, according to his father. So some of them we just have a blip of information, obviously. But this next one is sad. Another man, George Lancor, took the Osage Trail in December, but George wasn't traveling alone. With him, he had his 18-month daughter, Mary Ann. George was a Civil War veteran with his wife, Mary Jane, along with their then-infant son, moved to Onion Creek in 1870. They were part of a community there. George was a blacksmith and a really good one. The small family was doing really well. They were really close with their neighbors, the Yorks, who are important in this story. Okay. This was Dr. William York and his wife, Mary, along with their three small children. 
So if you haven't noticed, there's lots of Williams, lots of Marys, and lots of Johns. It in was this the story. name back then. <laughs> Sadly, by May of 1870, the infant son of George and Mary became ill and died. Oh, I believe of pneumonia. It all happened pretty quickly, but Mary Jane was already pregnant again and ended up giving birth shortly after that to Marianne. Okay. But the tragedy of this family continued because just a few days after giving birth, Mary Jane died from complications. Yeah. And she was only 21. Yeah, a lot of women died back then. So scary. George was alone with a brand new baby, and he made it work on his own for quite some time with the help of Mary York when she could. But when Mary got pregnant with her fourth child, it became too much for him to handle alone because it wasn't easy being a blacksmith and working the farm with a baby on your hip. No. So he decided that it was time to move to Iowa to be with his parents where he could have more support. Yeah, it makes sense. So he decided to pack up his life and his little girl and set out on his long journey. Upon leaving, he promised to write the Yorks when he arrived safe and headed out on the Osage Trail. So now we get to why the Benders, or at least the two younger Benders, were at times very welcoming and very nice, and at other times very cold and almost inhuman in the way they reacted to people stopping by their cabin. Okay. One man could tell something was up one night when he stopped to stay the night at the Bender cabin. And this was just a couple days after when George Lancor would have been by the cabin with his daughter along their journey. Okay. This man was John Handley. He was a repeat lodger and always looked forward to seeing Kate. But this time she was different. She didn't smile. She didn't care for conversation. And she refused to make food that night. And the place was just super dark and dingy. It was a cold December night. He had another guy with him and they wanted to start a fire. They tried but were stopped by John telling them that if they wanted a fire, they needed to pay for the wood. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Feeling completely unwelcome, the two decided to just leave and deal with the weather. They would rather be outside than be in that cabin. Okay. Which I get. Mm -hmm. Many today started to piece together that there was a bit of a pattern with the benders. We'll come back to this later, but it's possible that they didn't want John Handley and his friend there that night because they were in the middle of something. Right. The thought is, is that John Lancor stopped there with his baby a couple nights before. And they were busy dismembering or something? Well, in fact, what I haven't explained yet is that there was a cellar in their cabin. Oh, that brings a whole new dynamic. (laughs) Accessible via a trap door in the floor. Behind the canvas sheet, I'm guessing. (laughs) I found conflicting information, actually, on where this trap door was. Some sources say that it was right under the table that they had the guests sit at. So right under the chair where they were sitting. And it was kind of like, what, down you go type of situation. Mm -hmm. But... Another says that it was beneath the mattress in the back part of the cabin, which is what I believe. Okay. Either way, they dug out the cellar for a purpose and it wasn't for storage. Okay. It is believed that that is where they kept bodies until they could get rid of them or bury them, which would account for the smell so Mm -hmm. many people experienced when visiting this cabin. And with a fresh kill and it being winter, they couldn't bury George. So he was down in the cellar. Right. The ground was too hard in the winter, which means that they would have had to wait for it to warm up. So it wasn't a great time for people to be stopping by the lodge when you have rotten bodies beneath you. True. But that's how they killed and hid their victims. They just didn't think it all the way through. No. They're like, damn it, people smell when they die? (laughs) Why? (laughs) I didn't know that. (laughs) Oh, well. So now we're in 1873. The benders were becoming increasingly different towards others, and people were noticing. Mm -hmm. Kate used to be someone people looked forward to seeing, but now she was often unfriendly and agitated by others. Some even complained that she was bullying them. Sick people said she would push them to pay her for healing services, and if they didn't, again, she threatened to curse them. Or maybe kill you. (laughs) (laughs) She even started to lose her close friends. One of her friends, Delilah Dinst, really enjoyed Kate, but she wasn't into all the spiritualist stuff. Okay. She didn't really think anything differently of Kate for being a spiritualist. It only became a problem when Kate's bullying was directed at her. Mm -hmm. Delilah's family was the Bender's closest neighbors. Okay. And a year before, Delilah's husband, John, died in a fire. He was only 26 and they had two small daughters. At first, Delilah found comfort in talking to Kate about the spirit world, but when Kate asked her to do a seance, she didn't want to. 
She okay. came from a pretty religious background and didn't feel like it was something that she should be messing with. Mm-hmm. For a year, Delilah turned down Kate's advances and Kate would ask her every single time she saw her. And after a while, she was starting to see through her. You know, she's just this con artist. She just wants my money. Yeah. But on the anniversary of John's death, Kate really dug in deep, saying that it was the perfect time to contact him. Okay. But still, Delilah didn't want to and told her no. And she just remembers Kate's face turning cold, Mm. like just super displeased with her friend. (laughs) But that didn't stop Kate from trying again a week later. This time, Delilah's mother-in-law, Henrietta, stepped in and essentially told Kate to piss off. We don't want your services around here. (laughs) They said they didn't believe in what she did and that they thought she was a scam artist. Mm. This thoroughly pissed off Kate and the Uh, two families stopped seeing each other after this. It sounds like nothing happened to that family. Well, that's good. At least they didn't put them in their cellar. Right. (laughs) But they would have to go to her house and... She keeps saying no. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. Smart decision, Delilah. Why don't we name people Delilah anymore? I know why. Delilah, (laughs) how's it like in New York City? (laughs) And wasn't Delilah the one that tempted Samson and cut his hair in the Bible? You are asking the wrong person. (laughs) See, I went to a lot of Bible school. I think she was like a tainted woman in the Bible. That's why people don't say Delilah anymore. But I like the name. Yeah, it's very pretty. So now we're in March of 1873. And we're going to go back to the Yorks. Okay. They're like, we haven't heard from George. Yep. So Dr. William York was a former field surgeon in the Civil War. He survived, but barely. He was part of a group of 18 men that were captured and tortured by rogue Confederate soldiers, and some died. Mm. What they went through and just what he witnessed during the war itself changed him. And he felt a lot of shame for being the one that survived. So he kept himself pretty busy. And in March, he was planning to travel to Fort Scott to visit his father, who was not doing well, and to have some flowers and other plants sent back to his wife, Mary, in Onion Creek. And remember, Mary is pregnant. Yeah. She already had three kids, and she's young, and her husband is gone all the time for work, and she's lonely. So he thought it would be nice for her to see some flowers around the property. True. Which you just did. It's nice to see flowers around the property. Women love flowers, and men too. We all love pretty (laughs) colorful flowers. Come on. And this was possible because the York family actually owned an agricultural business in Fort Scott, and it was apparently one of the best nurseries in the region. Okay. So William wrote to his brother, Alexander, telling him about his upcoming trip and that he was planning to stop by in Independence to see him on his way. Alexander is an important person in the story as well. He was a former colonel in the Union Army, an attorney, and a state senator. So this family had a lot going on for them. Lots of connections. Yeah. What he didn't tell his brother was that a couple of months before, he received a letter from George Lanker's parents. Some say that they were his in-laws, actually, and it could be either Yeah, from the names I found. The first names were the same, but depending on the story you read, they either had the last name as Hughes or Lanker for these people. Okay. Doesn't really matter, but whatever. They got this letter. They wrote to William to say that George and Marianne never arrived. Not too long after, William saw a story in the paper about an abandoned wagon in Moorhead, which was north of Independence. In this wagon, people found items for both a man and a small child. Oh, okay. William was immediately worried that it was George and Marianne. William had sold him the wagon and horses, so he knew what that wagon looked like. Right. So he made a plan to stop by there to check it out after leaving Alexander's on his way to Fort Scott. Mm -hmm. At first, no one knew that he was going to be doing this. Okay. Which is not a good idea back in the day when there's no cell phones. Yes. (laughs) Tell someone where you're going. Right. And even tell someone where you're going if you have a cell phone, because that doesn't solve anything either. So William left on his trip. He stopped to see Alexander and then went on to Moorhead as planned. This was on March 4th. When he got there, he confirmed that it was his wagon. Mm. So he made the decision then and there that he was going to search for them. He spoke with others in Moorhead about putting together a search team to check surrounding areas. Unfortunately, he already imagined that they were dead. So 
Although he was concerned, he went on to see his father first in Fort Scott for a few days and then promised to return to help in organizing the efforts. Yeah, makes sense. While in Fort Scott, his father could tell that he was super distracted and finally got it out of him that he was consumed by his missing friend and his young daughter. Mm. He told his father that on his way back, he planned to take the route George would have been on and to stop at every home and ask about them. Okay. If he didn't get any answers, then he was going to go back to Moorhead. And he had also promised his brother Alexander that he would stop by again on his way back. Okay. Before leaving, William bought a beautiful, expensive new horse and then left on the Osage Trail. And he didn't have a lot of time to get all this done because it's now March 8th or March 9th. And he promised that he would be home in Onion Creek by the 18th. Okay. On the 18th, when Mary was expecting William to be home, there was a knock on her door. And it wasn't William. It was a man from Moorhead asking for William because he had never come back to help with organizing the search. William had never made it back to his brother Alexander's home either. So at the same time, Alexander wrote to his father to ask about his brother and if he knew where William was. Mm. When his father got this letter, he just immediately hopped on a train and went to Alexander's and told him about William's plan to try and look for his friend. Okay. With 10 days now passed and no word from him, it's now time to search for William. Right. And something no one else had before. The Yorks had power. Oh, yeah. They were wealthy. They held important positions and they had respect. Within a week, Alexander and their younger brother, Edward, put together a team of 65 men to search for William. One of these men was Thomas Beers. He was a private investigator and someone who's just going to be throughout the rest of the story. The group left to travel the Osage Trail and made their first stop in Osage Mission, where they did find people who had spoke with William. Okay. They said that he was heading to Lador. Lador was known for crime and violence. It was close to what was still Indian territory, and it was a railroad town, so a lot of outlaws visited the area. They were worried that William might have gotten himself into something there, and maybe someone did something to him. But after staying there a few days and asking around, they had no useful information. There were a couple of people that they suspected while there, but it ended up being a dead end. So they went on to Parsons. In Parsons, a clerk at the general store said that William was in the week before and bought some tobacco. They were also approached by a teenager that said William had asked for directions. He said he then rode off in the direction of Big Hill Creek, which is where William Jones's body was found the year before. Okay. So off this big group of men went. Along the way, or once there, they were connected with Leroy Dick. Mm. So if you remember, Leroy is the township trustee of Cherryville. Right. Who had the cousin. Yes, the cousin Hank. But Leroy is essentially the head of... If there's any type of law enforcement and he's not even that. So he's just like the guy, the guy, (laughs) the guy from the area who had any type of say and things, I guess. But he was approached by the York brothers asking if he knew of any criminals or oddballs in the community. Mm -hmm. And he immediately thought about the Benders, who he knew pretty well. John Bender used to go to church with him and stopped after a while, which was surprising to him because John could recite large chunks of the Bible. Okay. Ma and Pa were always thought to be a little crazy, but Mm -hmm. over the last several months, people were also complaining about John and Kate. And being asked the question, he realized, well, hmm. This sounds like a lead. They're quite an odd family. They can be quite rude. And John is gone for months at a time, and we have no idea where he goes. Right. And no one knows what he does for a living outside of this little inn and store that they have. Mm. He told the Yorks that and also that no one knows what the actual relationship is of all the benders. (laughs) That it's, you know, a rumor up in the air. He also mentioned the incident when the benders were accused of stealing Edward Earns' fiance's mother's jewelry and money. And he couldn't forget but mentioned that Kate was a professed medium who claimed to have healing powers. Okay. So they were definitely the odd family in the area. Although he ignored people's concerns before about the missing and murdered, Leroy agreed to help the York brothers search the creek, but refused to be there with the group when they went to the Benders. He didn't want them knowing that he was the one that offered Uh, up their name. Yeah. So they're afraid of the Benders. Either to save face or, yeah, yeah, scared. You're always scared of what you don't know. Mm-hmm. And she no one really him. knows them. Yeah, exactly. 
On April 3rd or 4th of 1873, Alexander, or Ed, I have read this story in both ways. Okay. Along with Thomas Beers and another man from the group, Jim Buster, went to the Bender cabin. What happens next, there are multiple versions of. Okay. Version one, when the men got there, John was outside reading the Bible, a German Bible. He pretty much ignored them as they went to the door. They were greeted by Kate and let inside. Kate, I guess, was having a good day because she was all smiles and back to her fiery red hair, vivacious self. Yeah. Yeah. And she was even more lively when Alexander told her he was there for her services. Okay. Finally, someone wants to pay for Somebody my talents. Somebody wants me. They like me. <laughs> It was a ruse of his to see if they could get her to talk because he mentioned his brother. He said he saw her ad in the paper and needed her help finding out via her spirit connection if he was alive or dead. Okay. Kate immediately started saying something like, well, that would take time, weeks, and money. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. The men started mumbling something to each other, stuff like, see, I told you she wasn't the real deal, blah, 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 blah. (laughs) And she heard this. And they started to leave and Kate stopped Alexander and told him to give her a week, but that he needed to come back alone. (laughs) Convenient. I I don't know what happened after this. So this is one version. The second version is that they straight up asked about William and if he had been there and that the benders said yes. Okay. That he stayed the night, but he was in one piece when he left and that he might have just run into some Indians or bandits Mm, after leaving. That's what happened. Because they've had their own trouble, you know, Mm -hmm. out there. In another version, they went there because they heard of a girl escaping the benders, saying that they tried to kill her. So they went there demanding answers, and Ma showed a different side of herself. She pretends she can't speak English. Mm, Convenient. But after too much drilling, she, like, lost it and went off on the men in clear English, (laughs) saying that she only went after the girl because she was a witch that cursed something of hers. (laughs) Okay. Which is interesting because everyone thinks they're the witches. And so if they're all witches, then it's a fellow witch blaming another witch. And yeah. Yeah, it's probably not the best defense. Bunch of witches. Yeah. Either way, the men eventually left because they didn't really have anything on them. Mm-hmm. But they did leave with this feeling that everything was just off. Okay. And there was that stench yeah. that was coming from the place and it was nauseating. So from there, they moved forward to independence. And even though the men thought nothing of the visit, really, the benders sure did because they started packing up. Oh, time to find a new murder cabin. Yep. (laughs) On April 8th, Leroy Dick held a meeting for the people of the town at the Harmony Grove Schoolhouse in Cherryville. He told them about the missing people, which at this point was eight men and one little girl. Yeah. Not including the other two found dead nearby with similar wounds to each other and all last known to be on the Osage Trail. Mm Mm-hmm. He told everyone that there would be a search of every homestead along the trail. Oh, okay. Everyone agreed, but there was one family missing from this meeting, the Benders. Because they're in a wagon getting the fuck out. Yeah. The next day, Thomas Beers received word about an abandoned wagon found outside of Thayer. In the wagon, they found a double barrel shotgun and a wood sign with the word grocery etched into it, but it was spelled incorrectly. It essentially said grow cry. Okay. They missed the E. So I saw it two different ways. So it was either Mm G-R-O-C-R-Y or G-R-O-C-R-Y-I-S. Either way, it was spelled incorrectly. But when they turned this sign around, groceries was spelled correctly. Okay. Now, people who knew the benders knew this was their sign. Even though they had the correct spelling on one side, they chose to put the misspelled side out to the public outside of the cabin. Okay. People have questioned why they would do this, but I think it was intentional. Depending on who might show up to your door, they could pretend to not have the best English or, Mm. and you know, and just take advantage of people in that way. Especially like, you know, mom and pop pretending they can't understand English. When they can understand every fucking word. Right. Yeah. Stuff like that. Or just to pretend they're stupid or something (laughs) for the same reasons. You know, someone might not find the family intimidating in that way. Mm -hmm. But the biggest find in this wagon was the wheels. Okay. Remember when William Jones was found dead and the owner of that land said he heard this weird noise coming from the wagon. And upon investigation, the tracks had shown that the back wheel was twisted and this wagon had the same issues. Okay. The same tracks. I don't know why they didn't immediately go to the benders after this, 
but they didn't. So hold on a second. I think okay. I think it was just a, a matter of remember this started with like 65 men. Yeah. I don't think they're all together. I think yeah, people are in different areas and right. just information's not getting back to whoever. They can't just call it up and right. say, hey, this is what I found. Because it wasn't until about a month later when someone else spoke up concerned about something on the Bender property. OK. And this was Billy Toll. At the end of April and in the beginning of May, there was really, really bad weather, torrential Mm -hmm. rain, which forced many people to stay inside for days because everything became just this thick mud outside. Right. But one day in Labette County, they had like this one nice day and Billy Toll, who was a neighbor of the Benders, went outside to look for some of his cattle who had run off in the storm the night before. Mm -hmm. He got on his horse to round them up and came upon the Bender cabin where he found a calf. It wasn't his calf, but this calf was not okay. It was emaciated and it was just laying in the mud. Okay. He was worried about the calf, so he ran into the bender stable to find some water and food, but then he found more cows in the same condition, all covered in flies. Okay. Cows don't get this way over just a few days, so it must have been weeks since they had received proper food and water. Mm -hmm. Approaching the cabin, he also noticed that just everything was dark. Mm Mm-hmm. And there was this sour, rotten smell that was wafting Ugh. through the air Yuck. coming from the cabin. And he noticed that the same smell was coming from a small orchard behind their cabin. Oh, OK. He was too scared to try and go inside. So he just went to the town to tell people what he found and that it seemed like the benders left some time ago, leaving behind their farm animals. OK. So as I said, you know, there really wasn't any kind of official law enforcement. Yeah. In most places, if things were bad, there would be this vigilante group, Mm -hmm. you know, that would form. In this area, Leroy was kind of the highest man up. So on May 5th, he rode out to the Bender cabin. Once there, he was immediately bombarded by the stench in the air. A stench he knew well from his time in the Civil War. Oh, okay. Dead. Dead bodies. Getting closer to the house, he noticed very large piles of manure and fresh earth outside of the barn and way too much of it. But he looked past that for a moment. But he knew that it was really strange because to have that much, they would have been having to dig really deep into the ground. Oh, okay. Getting to the door, he found that it was unlocked. So he let himself in. And inside, the smell of decay was very strong. He had been there before and there was always this disgusting smell, but this was different. Was this like was really overwhelming. strong. And it seemed to be coming from the back of the cabin, which is where the Bender family slept. So he went back there and saw a bit of a trap door sticking out from under the mattress. Mm -hmm. He moved the mattress and the smell intensified. I read in some sources that the trap door was nailed shut, but somehow Leroy opened it. Okay. He was expecting to find bodies, but he didn't. Okay. Thankfully, he got out of the cellar and found a Bible and a Catholic prayer book. Inside the book's covers was some writing. Okay. It was names of people, dates and events. Which, you know, a lot of people That's list off, but I'm, in, yeah. I'm not going to. I think people list it off because there's confusion there mm-hmm. as to who the benders actually were. There was also a mention of a Henry. And if you interpreted the dates, it would seem like maybe he was two years old. So, like, there's just some question okay. that maybe maybe that was John and Kate's son. And maybe okay. that child died. There, there's just no way to accurately understand what's written because we don't know we don't know and in one of them's in german so (laughs) yeah and i guess back then people always wrote like birthdays and and anniversaries and everything in the bible something i remember that that with my grandparents yeah like that was just a tradition yeah so i don't have that and i've also found conflicting information on what it actually says so there's just multiple versions in the story of everything But Leroy also discovered three hammers hiding under some newspapers under a stove. It was a claw hammer, a long hammer, and a sledgehammer. Oh, wow. So they were varied in their death weapons. Yep. With that, Leroy, he just had the chills and he knew he needed to get some men out there and that there needed to be a full-scale search of the property. So the next day, many men showed up with shovels to start digging. Oh, gross. They're going to find some gnarly stuff. (laughs) First, they dug up the stables and found nothing. Okay. Which is interesting. That seems like somewhere you could do it, but they decided not to. Then they went back to the cellar. Somehow they were able to just, I mean, I guess it really was a small house, but they were able to just pick up and move the cabin out of the way so that they would have better access to the cellar. 
Okay. The cellar floor was covered in a sandstone slab, Mm. which they removed first. And as soon as that was taken off the ground beneath, the men were just hit with this smell smell that just almost knocked them out. Several rushed out of the cellar to throw up. It was just really, really bad. They didn't find bodies, but what they found was a massive amount of congealed, stinky blood that just soaked through the earth. Okay. And a lot of it. While men were digging in the cellar, taking shifts, Edward York was searching the cabin. And while searching, he saw something larger. Well, this is one version. While searching, he saw something larger under the store counter. It was a saddle. Okay. And it was one that he recognized. It was his brother's. Oh, yeah. And another story, it's his glasses that he finds. His so he finds something that he his knows. His brother's spectacles. Yeah. yeah. So he ran out to go tell people, but he got distracted by the small orchard. Mm-hmm. Remember, his family owned an agricultural business and nursery, so he could tell that the earth had been recently dug up okay, or turned over. So he yelled at some of the men, come dig here. Yeah. And they followed him with their shovels and he had them start at a point that looked like the freshest. Okay. After just a few shovels worth of soil were removed. You could smell the decay. Mm -hmm. And after just a few minutes, they uncovered the first of many bodies. Oh, God. And sadly, this was his brother, William, because he was the last to be murdered. Yeah. So his head was smashed in and his throat was slit. He had on only an undershirt. There was a doctor on site. His name was Dr. Kibbles, who was helping in the search. And he was able to determine that the blunt force trauma was made by two different weapons. Okay. And Leroy remembered that he had three hammers Mm -hmm. that he found. So, And they were actually in his horse satchel. So he ran to go get them and brought them to the doctor. And he confirmed that two of the three hammers were used to kill William. Okay. They also ended up finding a knife hidden in a clock in the cabin that okay. still had dried blood on it. Yeah. So they were doing something with the blood. Well, it was or... soaking in the earth. So here's the part that I don't really cover. If they were more into, say, more of a mm, scarier version of spiritualism right. or witchcraft, then it's possible that they were using the blood for something that's that was where my mind automatically went I mean there's some another kind of reason there's another reason as we go through this but if they were those types of people I mean it's possible yeah or they were vampires <laughs> actually I like that idea because although no we'll come back to it don't okay. forget to mention that but that actually makes sense if I bring up this other thing so anyway I'll come back so I'm also going to list if I have the details what they had with them. Okay. Since theft was part of the Bender's whole game here. Yeah, that's how they're making all their money. William was said to have had $2,000 on him at the time. Okay, that's a lot. Yeah. Over the next couple days, more human remains were uncovered. And the next body uncovered was Leroy Dick's cousin, Hank, Mm -hmm. or Henry McKenzie, that he didn't know was missing. So it was quite the shock. Yeah. He thought he sent him on his way and... And didn't care if he got there or not. Didn't (laughs) care, but obviously that was probably a shot to his ego or whatever. Yeah. Poor Hank. Yeah. He had the same wounds to his head and neck, but Hank also had many defensive wounds, so he did fight back. He fought back. Hank had less money on him, only $36, but he had a team of horses with him when he was traveling. And horses were like cars back then. You know, they were very valuable. They're still very valuable today. So Mm -hmm. all his horses were gone, obviously. Next was William McCrotty. It's been a while, but he was the man who went missing in December of 1872. They were only able to identify him because he had a telling tattoo. Oh, okay. His name, his date of birth, and the regiment he served in the war because, you know, if your body is found in the war, it's a way for others to identify you. Right. Little did he know that that would help him be identified in an entirely other way, Mm -hmm. which is really sad. He was found face down with his undershirt and overshirt vest and socks on. He had a blow to the head and his neck was sliced open. And as far as what he had with him, it was the same as Hank, essentially. He had $38. Okay. A wagon and a team of horses. Okay. Then it was Benjamin Brown who was found. 
some sources say that he had fifty dollars on him, while others say twenty five hundred, which is a big That's difference. A big difference, yeah. But if you remember, he was the man that left to get a loan and was denied. Oh, he probably didn't have that much money then, right? And decided to try his luck in independence. I don't know. Like back then, did you have to do down payments? I mean, what's to more likely loan? to have yeah. fifty or twenty five hundred? I mean, it could be either. It doesn't matter. Yeah. But regardless, he disappeared before getting to independence. His wife, you know, she went on her own journey looking for him and stayed with the Benders at one point. He was killed in the same way, but this time he had no clothes on other than a handkerchief around his neck. And he was actually identified because of a little ring he had on his pinky finger. Okay. This one is sad to me because he didn't want to go home with nothing. Yeah, he was trying so hard. that's why he kept on. And then his wife went looking for him. Yeah. They also later discovered that some of his horses were seen in Arkansas. So they sold them off probably. Yep. So they're selling the horses. Yeah. We haven't touched that really. Horses and money. Each right. one of these people had both. So they were picking out people with the most money, it seems. It's not like they can know exactly how much money someone has on them, but if they show up with a nice horse. They're like, I want that horse. Yeah. Yeah. There's at least that. This led to the theory that, you know, maybe that's the only reason why they're killing them mm-hmm. is just to take this. And, you know, it was that ruthless back then. Yeah. It's a but way to make money. I think that it was kind of a bonus for a couple of them. Okay. Really. There was other reasons. I think a couple of these family members maybe had some screws loose and they enjoyed it Mm -hmm. it seems like a lot of work for a little bit yeah so i don't know because you have to leave to go very far to go pawn this stuff yeah seems like a lot of work for a little bit (laughs) if you're just doing it for thieving right next up was widowed george lancor which started this whole search right I mean, William did, but he only disappeared because he was looking for George. Right. George was found in the same way as the others with his neck sliced, but quite deeper. Okay. So his head was kind of off, off to the side. But his grave wasn't empty. His baby. Sweet little Marianne was with him at his feet. She was wearing a dress and mittens. Unlike her father, Marianne had no visible wounds or marks on her body. And Dr. Cables determined that she had been buried alive. Oh, my God. That's horrible. So I don't know. It's possible she could have been actually suffocated first. Like with a pillow or something. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hope so. Let's hope so because buried alive is different than suffocating. Yeah. So I don't know, but that's the story was that she was buried alive. Okay. George would have been a gold mine if theft was their goal. Because he was moving. He had everything with him. He had his entire life in that wagon. Mm -hmm. And he had a team of horses and $2,900. Okay. So... When he came along, you know, maybe they didn't want to deal with a little kid, but they would deal with it because of what he had. Yeah. And after that gruesome discovery, they found James Farrick. James was the one who never made it back after dropping off his wife and son at the train station. Oh, okay. He wasn't actually immediately identified. In fact, it was a year later that his remains were claimed. I'm not sure how they determined it was him, but he was released to his family. Okay. And there are some conflicts with the next two people, I'm going to say, at least in regards to where they are found, because sources tend to list one or the other. And I think it's just a mix up over time. Okay. Johnny Boyle, sometimes referred to as Peter or William. We haven't talked about him because I just, you know, only have a few details. (laughs) Yeah. So some people I don't mention. From what I found, he went missing in October of 1872. And he was only identified because of his shirt. Okay. And this is because it was a unique shirt that his wife had made for him. Okay. Like some others, he was on the trail, headed somewhere to complete some kind of real estate transaction. Mm -hmm. And he was said to only have $10 on him, but he had a pacing mare and a very expensive saddle that was like worth $850 at the time. Okay. The other body that is creating some conflict here is who some believe to be a man named Jack Bogart. His body was much more decomposed than others, which led some to thinking that he may have been their first victim of the house. Right. But that could have been where he was found, too, because while digging up in the orchard, there were others still searching other areas of the property. And he was found wedged six feet into an old well. Oh, okay. His body was not like the others. It was mutilated. And it seemed like he had been burned alive, actually, with the way that his body was contorted. Okay. So depending on which story you're reading, that's eight or nine people so far. Mm -hmm. And if you include the remains of William Jones, John Phipps, and the other unidentified male that was found in many pieces nearby earlier, that brings the total to 11 or 12. Okay. These totals are more consistently cited with the person often ending in 
well, you know, they're serial killers, so there's likely more. I believe with 11 or 12 in the span of a couple years, of course there is. Yeah, and they moved on to a new place. Mm -hmm. But a lot of sources do say that there's probably 21 or 22. Because some of them could be bodies on the trail that they never found. John was always gone, right? He could have been taking bodies somewhere. True. It's really all over the damn place. So I'm actually going to cover a few other ones that have been brought up. Okay. As well as some other controversial things. Now, remember, this is a 150-year-old story. Right. (laughs) That's a long telephone game. Yeah, lots of things change. (laughs) It wasn't a big city. You know, there weren't reports and documentation. Nothing was well kept. And they're in the middle of buttfuck Kansas. Yeah. You know? So one controversial body was that of Marianne Lancor. With most sources, she's 18 months old, Mm -hmm. right? But there's a couple that list her as eight years old. Oh, okay. That's a big difference. Big difference. I'm not sure which to believe. I think it's the baby. Yeah, because, because the mom they're died. in the same grave. They're listed as being in the same grave. So it would seem likely that only a baby would fit at his feet. But And his wife had died in childbirth. Right. So I think it's younger. Yeah. yeah. Either way, it's horrible. But it gets even worse if you think about her because she was not decomposing at the same rate as her father. And if you remember, it's thought that her father, George, was not buried outside for some time. Oh. Being that it was the middle of winter. Yeah. He was the one that Mm -hmm. was probably in the cellar when that guy stopped by to see Kate. Exactly. Which would mean that they kept her alive. Why? For possibly several months before burying her with him once they were able to get the ground thawed. Maybe they were fine killing grown men, but children was harder. But that means they took care of her in a way, but had no problem dis disposing of her when later yeah that doesn't make sense they had to have bonded with her a little bit and then to kill her and then just to like get rid of her i don't know but that would make sense why they were so displeased when that guy showed up because they're also trying to keep a baby baby quiet quiet, yeah you know where'd you have that baby i guess you really are lovers (laughs) you know (laughs) yeah true i didn't notice you pregnant last time kate that's so weird The other controversial piece is that not only eight or nine bodies were found on the property, some sources claim that there were more found. Okay. Some think there's still more there today that haven't been found even. Possible. One piece of this is that there was a grave that was found, but it had multiple body parts. Oh, okay. None of which belonged to any of the other victims unearthed. And there were too many of the same body parts, which meant multiple people. So there was at least three victims there. Okay. Which kind of makes you think, of you know what you brought up what are they doing with the other parts maybe that's what they feed the people who stop in that's for what dinner I, I know Ew, i just thought of that that's what i said at the beginning is that they're feeding the people oh i didn't think i must have not heard you <laughs> <laughs> it's sweeney todd where she made the meat pies out of everybody I, I never heard anybody say that in this story i didn't think about that hmm. or they could have been eating people maybe they were cannibalistic you know there's all kinds of things that anybody could have been doing back then yeah scary and that's why it was smelly and they used the cell to store the meat yum special soup at the bender hotel bender inn whatever it was good thing i'm a vegetarian everywhere i go or i don't know you (laughs) (laughs) others mentioned to have been found on the property include jackie boley he came from macon city illinois his horse was found at liberty which was a railway station 16 miles south of the scene of the murders okay he was a very large man and that's how they were able to identify him So I've heard a bunch of stories and he's not mentioned, but then in other ones he is. So it's like this list has just been skewed over time. Yeah, it's bound to happen. Yeah. And then we have Alonzo Sconce. He was a young Irish laborer. He is said to have been identified via his socks and teeth. Okay. He left Sycamore Township in Montgomery County to visit his brother-in-law Osborne in Parsons before disappearing. Some reports say that his body was also found in the well. So I know they had two wells on the property. One was probably for drinking. (laughs) Ew. You don't want to throw the dead body in the drinking well. That's why I'm saying the other one was probably where they put the bodies. For disposal. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Some other sources list four more, but I have no details on them. So I just have their names. This includes John Greary, Red Smith, Abigail Roberts, and another unidentified woman. Okay. And some sources include four other bodies that were found in Drum Creek which is in Montgomery County, south of Cherryvale and east of Independence. These four were included in the total because their skulls were smashed in and their throats were slit. I mean, that sounds... Yep. Some say that one of these bodies was Jack Bogart, 
So I don't know. It's really hard to piece this one together. You just got to put out what's being said. Yeah, we don't know. 150 years ago. But if you consider all of what I've just said, then that brings the total to 24 to 25 victims. Yeah. And some believe there are even more. Probably. Might be out there in the ground. Yeah. Somewhere else. Or they were washed away in a creek and got eaten by animals and never to be found. Yeah. For those who were uncovered, if not collected by someone, which was a good amount, they were buried a mile away at the base of a small hill in the area now known as the Bender Mounds. Okay. Some have spent time trying to find where this old homestead is because they believe that there are more bodies. But why would they need to try so hard to find this place? Well, that's because there's nothing left. Obviously, this was a long time ago, but no one knows the location at all because of people. This was a sensation when it happened. Oh. And back then, people couldn't help themselves. Just take shit. Yep. Morbid curiosity got the best of them. For weeks, masses of people would show up to grab a piece. Yeah, they do this. (laughs) This is like Henry Kaifak. They did that shit too. Like people were a different breed. I know. (laughs) They were different species back then. It literally could just be like a tiny piece of wood. It didn't matter. They would take it because it's a souvenir of a brutally violent place. Yeah. And for some time, a train used to make rounds to the place, almost like a tour. (laughs) (laughs) And then the travelers would get to get out and roam the property, grab something and head back. Wow. Depending on the source at one time, and this was in a newspaper, but there were 1,000 to 3,000 people there one day. Damn. That's a lot of people. I guess there's just not much else going on yeah. in your life back so then. So boring. Pieces and bits of the property were taken until absolutely everything was gone, and that included the trees. <laughs> people were <laughs> digging the trees up. This was once on the Bender property. Why would you want to bring that home? I was just it? about. To, <laughs> I was just sitting here thinking, this is why there's so many fucking haunted places now because people like yeah. took all this shit to their houses. Yeah. So, what was their method of murder? We know what they were murdered with, but right. how did they continuously get away with it? After receiving testimonials from those who had been there and then had strange interactions with the benders, Mm -hmm. it was decided that Kate would sit at the table with the guest, either to visit with them or have a seance. Yeah. And they were insistent that they sit in a particular chair with the one with its back to the canvas that hid the back of the cabin. Then at some point, one or more of the benders would sneak up from behind, Mm -hmm. (laughs) hit him on the head, which is why some had multiple wounds from different hammers. Yeah. They would then take the dying person to the trap door, open it, slice their throats open over the top of the trap door and toss them in. Throw them down. And that is why there is so much blood Blood. down there. They all just bled out down there. Mm Mm-hmm. This allowed the benders to kill them quickly and let them bleed out down there until they were ready to bury them, Mm -hmm. which was probably tricky because it's not like it's something they can do during the day. No. It has to be good weather. Otherwise, it's just going to undo whatever they did or the ground's going to be too cold. So who knows how long people were down there. There might have been multiple people down there at one time. Yeah. And that's why everybody said it smelled. Until they could have one big burying day, I guess. How did they keep guests from showing up? They're like out there like digging graves. I guess, yeah, they had to have done at night. Yeah, probably the only way you could do it. After this, they would gather all the person's belongings and get ready to sell them or hand it over to someone else to have them sell it. Yeah. And the horses and wagons, because everyone murdered at least had one horse. Yeah. Well, that's why John was gone Gone for weeks Mm -hmm. at a time, traveling far away to do something with them and get them out of the area. Get money. But one thing's for sure, after finding all these bodies, they needed to find the benders. Yeah, where were they? Where the frick did they go? They disappeared. Now they are known as the bonders in a different area. (laughs) They're now the fenders. The fenders. (laughs) That would be a good one. Yeah, the fenders. I'm like, what's their new last name? Well, three men made it their mission to find the bloody benders. Okay. This included Marshal Jim Snotty, Thomas Beers, and Charles Peckham. Their first stop was the abandoned wagon near Thayer that I mentioned previously. What I didn't mention was with that wagon inside, there was also an abandoned dog. The dog was determined to be the Bender's dog. Okay. They decided to go to the train station there and ask around. A man that worked at the ticket station remembered them. It had been weeks, but they were heading about 40 miles north to Humboldt, Kansas, This was on April 4th, which was the same night that Alexander went to the Bender home. Oh, okay. The ticket man remembered them because Pa Bender had an unusual trunk. 
this trunk was made of dog hide, Ooh. which wasn't normal. And he remembers watching him kick their actual dog out of the train as it was pulling away. Wow. This is how they found their dog in the wagon because somehow this poor dog found his way back to it, being that it was all he knew at the time. That's really sad. Hopefully yeah. he got a new owner that treated him well. He was malnourished, but when found, he survived at the time. And he was a small dog from what I read. Okay. So the men traveled to Humboldt. They found out that the benders split up there. The younger benders got on a train to Denison, Texas. Okay, great. While the older benders went to St. Louis, Missouri. Okay. At first, no one could say that they had seen the younger two in Denison. And although the older benders were remembered in St. Louis as someone dropped them off at a boarding house via a carriage... By the time the men got there, they were all gone. Yeah. The boarding house, I guess, was owned by Pa's sister. Okay. But she didn't know where they had gone. But it is believed they met up with the younger two in Denison and went from there. It was after this that the owner of a boarding house in Denison remembered the foursome because they had a tent set up near his building. Okay. What he didn't know was that they were heading to Red River Station to meet up with a friend. Mm. This friend was Frank McPherson. His brother, William, also known as Missouri Bill, was sort of like the mob leader there. Oh, great. The McPhersons were the Bender's associates. Mm. Bad people making friends with bad people. Kind of how it works. Yep. When the Benders killed someone, they took their stuff and horses and they would hand it over to the brothers to sell uh, in other areas. Okay. They're their pawn brokers. Yep. Far away. So no one could identify anything. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be until the end of that year that Snotty, <laughs> I like that name, Snotty, that Snotty, Beers, and Beckham heard that they were going there. So they went to Red River Station. The Benders had been gone a long time at this point, but they questioned Missouri Bill. He actually pretended to help them at first. Okay. He took them out in a direction he said he had a lead on, but would then like leave them for days mm. and then come back and say, oh, not there. They went this way. <laughs> I heard wrong. <laughs> this lasted for several weeks until Bill never came back one day and the men ended up going back with their tails between their legs. So they never found him? Nope. It was shortly after this that they found out that Missouri Bill left right away after the men did and that he was headed to Chickasaw Nation. Okay. This is where they believed the benders were hiding because hiding in Indian territory was a typical thing for criminals and outlaws to do because there was no jurisdiction in these areas. Okay. They were believed to be at an outlaw camp at Mud Creek. So Beers hired a man to help him get out there, but when he got there to the camp, it was abandoned. The Benders, McPhersons, and a few others had crossed the Red River into Clay County, Texas. There they met up with and stayed with another of their associates before heading up the river to Wanderers Creek to camp with a band of outlaws at Prairie Dog Corners. Prairie Dog Corners. <laughs> at some point, moving further north to another camp at the Camp Rock Escarpment, which I guess is just this area where you can get out of the way from the prairie winds yeah. and stuff. At this point, a lot of time had passed. It was the end of 74, and it would be years before anyone heard of a possible location for them again. Wow. In 1883, the owner of a silver mine in Arizona, Thomas Gates, wrote to the governor of Kansas saying that the benders were in Gila County in Arizona, but then a few months later heard that they were camping at a secret location in Colorado, which made sense because from historical records, Frank McPherson was living in Gunnison oh, wow. at the time. And jump forward 14 years later, Frank was still in Colorado and living in Los Animas. Okay. Now, all these years, outside of Beers making his way out to Mud Creek, they didn't really search for them. Mm -hmm. They kept their ears to the ground just in case something concrete came through, but it was becoming too expensive to yeah, chase them all over that. the place. Others had been arrested as their accomplices back in Kansas, but really it was just other spiritualists of the areas that they rounded up. Okay. Assuming that they were all part They're of all this doing it. murderous <laughs> cult. Nothing came from that. The closest they got was arresting two women in 1889 who they thought were the two Bender women. Okay. This is an interesting story. This was Elmira Monroe and her daughter, Sarah Davis. Okay. Sarah was arrested in Niles, Michigan, on a larceny charge. Mm -hmm. She was not found guilty, but after just a day of being out, both Elmira and Sarah were arrested again for the Bender murders. Oh, okay. Why? 
because a woman from Kansas, Frances McCann, who claimed to be a clairvoyant healer with psychic abilities, told authorities of the time that Sarah used to do domestic work for her and that one day she told Sarah about a dream she had about two women murdering a man. Okay. She said Sarah's reaction to this was dramatic. And that Sarah claimed that her family had killed Francis's father when she was young. Okay. I know it's getting odd. Weird. Francis didn't know her family or where she came from because she was orphaned at three years old. So Francis believed her. And shortly after this, I guess Sarah left Kansas. Mm -hmm. Over time, Francis became convinced that the two women she saw in her dream was Ma and Kate Bender and that Sarah was actually Kate. Okay. And they killed her father. Well, damn That she never met. That she had a dream about. Okay. (laughs) Somehow that got the two women arrested. (laughs) Light evidence needed back then. (laughs) Yes. And instead of insisting, you got the wrong people, they said they were the Benders. Oh, (laughs) What? (laughs) They agreed and said, yes, we're the benders. That's weird. Apparently, there was a lot of beef between mother and daughter, and they were just throwing accusations out there about each other. But of course, then followed up by, but I'm innocent. (laughs) Apparently, it was the mother who reported her daughter for larceny. Okay. So there's a fucked up family. Yeah. She accused her of stealing some shit from her. And Sarah said that what she was being accused of stealing were wedding gifts from her mother. So family drama. Yeah, it's really all quite silly. But now being arrested for the Bender murders, of all things, it became headline news. Mm -hmm. It was honestly just a big mess of two people pointing fingers at each other and the newspapers going crazy over it with gossip. (laughs) (laughs) But when they were actually on trial for the murders, a neighbor of the Benders was brought to the courthouse to identify the women and said, "Um, who are these people? (laughs) Because this isn't Mom K. Bender. I guess Leroy came too and he's like, that's them. Oh, God. I just think he was too old at this point. (laughs) Something else was going on with him. He's like, it's two women. It must be them. (laughs) Right. After this, it came out that Francis, the lady who said it was them, paid the women $50 each to hurl these accusations at each other. And because they already had bad blood with one another, they just like got carried away with it. And they were okay going to jail. (laughs) They're like, ah, why not? Yeah, because the mom's like, well, in the papers, everybody is talking that Kate is the main murderer. So she's like, I'm good. Like, my daughter will go to jail for all these murders, not me. This was the original, like, people doing shit just for the 15 minutes of fame. Yeah. Blaming your mother or your daughter for multiple murders is not the way to get back at someone you're angry with. Uh, No. (laughs) <laughs> anyway, they were eventually let off the hook when their lawyers, who are doing their job despite their crazy ass clients' accusations of each <laughs> other, proved that neither woman were anywhere near Kansas during the murders. Oh, okay. Well, that's clear. <laughs> What a waste of I time. Know. It was fun for everybody, though. Yeah, I mean, it was a good it was entertainment, good entertainment, like People magazine kind of shit. Right. Back then. <laughs> well, the Benders were never caught for their crimes. Oh. And their identities have been a subject of debate for a really long time. Hmm. Most believe that Ma and Kate were mother and daughter. Okay. Some people got very specific and say that Kate was born as Johanna Bender okay. and was possibly her fifth born. Pa Bender is not believed to be Kate's father, like I mentioned, but just one of Ma's several husbands. John, as we know, was portrayed as Pa and Ma's son and Kate's brother, but the consensus is that he wasn't. He was just some random dude they found. Most believe that John and Kate were common law man and wife. Yeah. John not only introduced himself occasionally as John Gabhart, there are also some other names for him in various crevices of the internet. (laughs) <laughs> including John Greger and George Bender. Okay. So who knows? It's believed that Kate was born in America to German-speaking parents, Ma and one of her past fellows, and that Pa and John immigrated from Germany. Okay. It's possible those two knew and traveled together and met Ma and Kate at the same time. Yeah, So possible. maybe John and Pa are father and son. Could be. We'll just never know. Yeah. <laughs> and it's highly likely that all of their names were made up. True. For instance, Pa is also written about as having the last name Flickinger. Okay. And that he was from New York. Okay. So. (laughs) In other words, we don't know what we don't know. We don't know what we don't know. (laughs) Although Kate seems to have played a huge role in everything, most people see John and Pa as the main murderers. Mm, Yeah, with the hammers. They have the brute strength. Right. And that Kate and Ma were just there to help clean it up. They're the cleanup crew. Although sources specifically call out Kate as being the one that sliced the necks. 
Maybe, but she was also the one that drew them all in. She was like the decoy that right. got them she in. She was the so. pretty one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't think we'll ever know because there's not someone who lived to talk about it. No. <laughs> Either way, I believe they certainly killed more people after this. Of course. There were several people who were trying to cash in on the reward money that was being offered to find them and went off on their own journeys and never came back. Oh, shit. So I think they found them. And, and they, they were killed like, them. Mm, bye. They're like, congratulations. There's four of us you and did. one of you, you dummy. Yeah. I wouldn't want to go looking for them unless I had like 10 no. people. And it's also possible they did exactly what they did in Osage and just settled down somewhere under new aliases. That's what I think they did. Yep. They just changed their name every couple years. And I'm going to come to one. For example, we have the Kellys. Oh. Some believe the Benders from Osage are the exact same family as the Kellys that lived near Oak City in no man's land, Kansas, what is now the Oklahoma Panhandle and 25 miles from Beaver, Oklahoma. Okay. Their stay here was from August to December of 1887. Okay. So it kind of fits the time time wise. Okay. And if it is them, then the mystery is solved because, well, not exactly who they are, but what happened to them because they're dead. The Kellys are? Yes. Okay. This family claimed to be from Pennsylvania. Okay. Which I believe there was a big German community in Pennsylvania. Okay. It's not a far stretch there. Right. Just like the Benders, it was a group of four people. Okay. Two older, two younger. The father was named William. Mm-hmm. Mother was Kate. Mm-hmm. Son, Bill. And daughter, Kit. Okay. The only thing that doesn't match up for me is the ages that they were reported being at this time. Because they're listed as being younger than they were when they were in Osage. Okay. But remember, people were really bad at guessing ages yes, back in these and days. there's not as much on this story versus the benders, whereas the benders was told a million times over. Right. So, and like you said, maybe they're vampires, so they don't age anyway. That's possible. Maybe they get a little <laughs> bit younger with the blood that they're drinking. That's what, yeah, that's what I believe. <laughs> because this was 14 years later. Oh, yeah, shit. Yeah. <laughs> they would have been like in their 70s by then, mom, pa. I think you just look old when you're rough out in the sun and all the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's possible that John and Kate looked young too. Well. That they could pull it off for longer. True. Yeah. And then when you're old, you're just old. And when you're, (laughs) that's the whole point of cannibalism, right? They say if they're like eating people, it's supposed to like be the fountain of youth. So maybe they found it. They tapped into that. Yeah. But that's something we're never going to know because the images of these four are all over the damn place. Okay. And there is no way to confirm any of the supposed images and drawings. I'll include them in a post, obviously, but they all look different. (laughs) Okay. And it's possible that the ages, you know, it's just whatever. Anyway, the family did exactly what the Benders did. Oh, they killed people. In a span of a few months, people were going missing from the road leading to the Kelly cabin and tavern. Oh, and it was tavern. Yeah, that sounds pretty sus. They weren't suspected of anything until they just up and left one day. Oh, okay. (laughs) And this was only discovered when a man, S.T. Gregg from St. Louis, who had been to the tavern before, decided to stop there along his travels. Instead, he found a tavern that reeked of death. Oh, God. And they found bodies again? No one was there, but he found the source of the smell coming from a trap door in the floor that led Mm. to a hidden cellar. But unlike what was found on the Bender property, this time there were bodies down there. Okay. Three men. He immediately told the authorities and parts of the property were dug up. Again, suspicious of the mounds of soil found near a barn... Overall, there were 11 victims, nine men, and two women. Most of the victims were too decomposed to identify. They were only able to identify three of the victims from their clothing. Okay. This was Jim Coven, who was a cattleman whose business covered that area in Texas. Then J.T. Taylor, who was a missing wealthy business salesman from Chicago. And a Texas merchant named Johnson. But instead of hammers, it was from the butt of an axe. Okay, so a new blunt force trauma. And they were finished off with the... With the neck. Sharp point of the axe. But they wouldn't get away with it. Okay. Not long after the discoveries, authorities got word from Beaver, Oklahoma, that the four had traveled through there on their way to New Mexico. Mm. They had a lot of money on them Mm -hmm. and a team of horses. Mm -hmm. In response, 20 men followed their trail until they ended up in Wheeler, Texas, where they actually caught up with them. Mm. In a shootout. It was a two hour chase. Okay. (laughs) Kate Kelly or Ma, I know it's hard calling her Kate now, but Ma died during this chase when her horse tripped and Kate flew to the ground and she broke her neck. Okay. About a half hour later, they caught up to Bill and Kit or John and Kate. 
Mm-hmm. William or Pa managed to escape for the time being. Okay. But Bill and Kit were hanged in a nearby tree. Oh, wow. And left there while they went after William. Vigilante justice right there. Mm-hmm. And they were able to catch up with him and did the same to him. Okay. So if this was the Bender family, which I it sounds really real think it is. Close, yeah. <laughs> it was the same modus operandi for the most part and the same family setup. So it's, it seems like they got what needed to come to them. Unfortunately, mm. they killed a lot more people. Before. Yeah, I think with this, I would say they're in the 50s as a family. I would say because they were first caught in Kansas, they could have done this in other places. Yeah, before, I mean, it's not like they know. were just born that year. Or they could have been doing <laughs> it in other countries if they came from Germany or something. Who fucking knows? Who knows? Either way, two serial killer families that close together in Kansas like this with all the same stuff going on. I don't know. What are the odds? So if it was them, they're dead. They yeah. died January 4th, 1888. Hopefully it was. Hopefully. Uh, I think that makes sense because if they were still alive, they probably would have kept killing because that's how they made money. And yeah, they weren't going to stop. That was their hobby. You don't just kill 11 people because you want some bread. And they may have been doing other things with the bodies, like rituals yep. and stuff. So they felt like they had to or whatever. Right. So, yeah, I think Benders are the Kellys and the Kellys are the Benders. Fenders and the Fenders are the McPhersons. I don't know, whatever. Yeah, whatever fucking name they came up with, wherever they moved. And it was easy to do this back then because, you know, the different districts didn't talk to each other. No. Or different states or, yeah, there's no law. They could have come out to, especially the Wild West, Colorado and New Mexico and Arizona. All of that was just, they went all over the place and they decided to come back to an area that wasn't really looked at. And if most of the people they were killing were just like cowboys who were going out on the trail, it's expected that half of them are going to die anyways back in the day. So nobody's really thinking much about it. They're like, oh, you know, Billy left, but he probably got eaten by a pack of coyotes or something. They're not looking for murderers back then. True. And I think that the reason they got caught this time is they went a little too hard because they did (laughs) they did the same amount that was initially found at this new place in a span of like five months months. versus, you know, a couple years. So, yep. Oh, wow. Well, their name matches. Yep. The Bloody Benders. They they are the Bloody Benders. Freaking crazy. Like, we think about serial killers today and things like that, but we don't often think about how easy it was back then. I know. That's and how why many we never caught. <laughs> when everybody's like, I want to go live back no. then, I'm like, I do not. Plus, that's when people literally could do whatever they wanted to you without any repercussions. Especially as women. And most of us died in childbirth at like 30. So that's true. After having five or 10. <laughs> 10 kids. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, no, thank you. No, thank you. And I'm just going to go back to it. The smells. Uh, no. <laughs> I can't do the smells. No. no. <laughs> so today, interest in the Bender family is still going strong. Yeah. And in 2021, a man who grew up on the story, Bob Miller, bought the land in hopes to find the original location and see if there are any more bodies that were left there. Okay. Now I'm wondering about the other location. So now he's just like digging up his whole property every day. No, he intended to hire people to search with ground penetrating radar because this is acres and acres and acres. In July of 2023, a team of researchers from Kansas University discovered broken bits of pottery and glass and old square nails. So they're pretty confident that they found the location of the cabin. Okay. And as of just last month, they announced that they plan to be out there this summer again and expand their excavation and dig deeper. And Oh, wow. So it's kind of a current thing going on right now, which is kind of interesting. So we'll see what happens with that. And if I hear anything, I guess I'll just give an update. But yeah, let us know. That's what we have. That's the Bloody Benders. Wild. Wild, wild west serial killer family. There can't be that many serial killer families out there. This is a no, unique No, that's one. unique, I yeah. think, to have everybody in on it. Yeah. Like, how do you come together and be like, hey, I would really like to kill people? It had to have started from like, a how do age. we make, yeah, that or just how do we make money? It, yeah, we to have me, to that's do how this. It started. And they're probably justifying it with religion in some way or. And then they started liking it or yeah. they started using it for rituals and who knows? Who knows? Like, I don't know what happens to people when they start killing. But if you have the proclivity towards that and you enjoy it and. And it seems like an addiction. Yeah. The high of killing someone, like the power behind it and everything. It's pretty fucked up. But I don't think like that. So I can't understand it. 
But they all found each other, these kindred souls. I guess so. <laughs> like to kill. Either way. And and they did it. Wow. Yeah. Well, thanks for putting the time into researching this. It sounds like it was a lot with different conflicting stories. And anytime you do these old timey cases, yeah. it can be really complicated research. So And at some point you just gotta throw your hands up and be like, Well, I'm just gonna tell you the story. It's the best I can do. The truth is is there's no way to verify a no. lot of this. So it is what it is. There's no eyewitnesses to tell us. <laughs> no, they're not around anymore. And even if they wrote it down, they're probably very biased in their hatred for certain things and yeah. blah, blah, blah. True. So I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. I did. I hadn't heard any of it. So this was all like new. I'm just sitting here like a little kid listening to a story. And I like these old time ones. I do too. Because we also learn so much about the things. history. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I enjoy about the old time stuff. Hopefully, you know, our listeners. I mean, I that too. I listen to other podcasts and where listeners come in and they're like, oh, the old time stuff. Stop <laughs> doing that. And I'm like, I don't know. I, I kind of like, like them. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, too. there is a difference between like true crime people who are listening to what's happening right now yes. and then what's happened before. Yeah. And I think we're trying to be a mixture of that. But we, we also are. don't want to do things too recent because sometimes you don't have all the information and. and and you don't want to be you don't want to draw the wrong conclusion right and yeah we're kind of sticklers for that and we want the most information possible and we also yes. want a, it to have come to some kind of closure unless it's one of those unsolved cases but yeah. even the unsolved cases we want it to have been long enough that there's theories out there and yeah and, and things but otherwise we're a journalist and that's not what we're doing exactly here. because I am dying to cover the Idaho state murders oh I know but I won't because yeah. The guy's still in trial, I think. I will be covering something pretty recent soon. And the only reason I am doing that is because court was settled. Okay. So well, yeah, um, as long as there's been yeah, a conviction. Something has to come to some kind of conclusion if we're going to cover it, I think. Because our brains can't handle it if it hasn't. No. And then <laughs> we're too busy. We want to be able to come back with, you know, updates. Yes. But we don't want it to be too split up. Yeah. Anyway. But next week, I have a kind of paranormal, spooky... I don't know. It's a mix of everything. Let's do it. We haven't done that in a while. So come back for that. Yes. If you have any lab reports, email that to lucidlabpodcast at gmail.com. And check us out on social media. We're on Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, and Facebook, all at lucidlabpodcast, one word. And go and rate us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts if you can. And share something with a friend. Yes, definitely. And next time you show up at an inn, an Airbnb, wherever you are, if there's a funky smell, get the fuck out. Get the fuck out of there. (laughs) Anyways, in the meantime, stay lucid, guys. We'll see you next week. Stay out of Kansas. Just kidding. Love you. (laughs) Goodbye. Bye.